Welcome. Thanks for watching this dairy video brought to you by Dairy Xnet. In this video, Dr. Robert Van Son joins us to discuss the role nutrition plays in lameness. If you'd like alerts on new articles, videos, and resources, be sure to check out the video description below to follow us on Facebook and Twitter or sign up for our newsletter. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Today's presenter, Robert Van Son, is an extension veterinarian and professor of veterinary science at Pennsylvania State University. He has been on faculty at Penn State for 17 years with responsibilities in teaching, extension, and field investigation. Dr. Van Son received his veterinary degree and completed his master's degree and residency training at Michigan State University. He has earned a PhD degree in ruminant nutrition from Cornell University. He was in private veterinary practice in New York and Michigan and a clinician at Oregon State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. His research and extension programs focus on the integration of nutrition, animal health, and productivity, as well as emphasizing the critical role of pregnancy nutrition on animal performance. His dairy cattle research primarily addresses issues of transition nutrition, nutrition in an effort to reduce metabolic disease and promote productive and reproductive performance. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And welcome everybody to this educational video, part of a ongoing program by Dairy Xnet to uh, address the topic of lameness. We had a previous presentation by Katie Proudfoot talking about the recognition of lameness, and then I'll follow up today in talking about some nutritional causes, and then we will have subsequent educational videos that will address uh, infectious disease prevention and facilities and I'll try and tie some of that together uh, today. So is diet the problem to lameness? And that seems to be a simplistic approach. Uh, we all think about acidosis or pH load in the rumen as the primary nutritional contributor, but what I want you to take away from today is to, to go beyond that thinking and, and, and maybe think beyond the, the traditional dogma. Now that's not to say that pH load and, and diet is not to be um, uh, completely discounted. The dietary starch content in the diet, uh, the degradability of starch uh, in the diet, the fiber content, the effectiveness of the fiber to stimulate chewing, and dietary buffers all can play a role in mitigating or controlling or uh, influencing the pH load and ultimately what may occur in the rumen itself. Now, this sort of linear diagram takes from the concepts that were put forward in the relationships between hindgut fermentation, from grain overload in horses to the very common laminitis or inflammation of the uh, lamina or uh, corium in the, in the hoof that we see in horses. And this was from a, a summary paper by Dr. Jim Nosek, where he then sort of extrapolated to a rumen acidosis, this increased lactic acid production, lowering pH, and that Lower pH results in bacterial death within the rumen, typically of these gram-negative bacteria, which then are known to release endotoxin. And it's thought this endotoxin is absorbed across the rumen wall. And this then can have impacts on blood circulation, leading to some changes in blood circulation within the, the uh, soft corium or uh, sensitive uh, lamina of the hoof, uh, inflaming it, and then this leads to changes, physical changes in the claw and the supportive structure that ultimately lead to the lameness problem. However, the support for the concept has not been uh, completely uh, positive, especially relative to 
we can recognize a lot of endotoxin release in the in the rumen with low pH, but we don't see it in the blood. At least not all studies show that. But anyway, coming back to this, the rumen acidosis, as we just described, lack of, eff of effective fiber in the diet, poor feeding management practices, which we'll highlight, improper forage concentrate ratio, poor rumen buffering can all lead to more of this ruminal acidosis. But again, if truly gram-negative bacteria, the death of gram-negative bacteria releasing endotoxin is, is a contributing factor, then things like infectious diseases such as metritis or mastitis could also potentially contribute to this and, and lead to some lameness issues. We have environmental problems, uh, trauma, the handling, the trimming, heat stress, the environment. This will all be topics of a future uh, webinar by Doc, uh, Dan McFarlane. And then we also have the potential for metabolic disorders. So uh, milk fever ketosis can, can lead to some challenges maybe through a mechanism that we'll discuss here in a moment in terms of uh, body condition. But this then leads us to go beyond the rumen feeding practices and, and maybe transition nutrition in addition to uh, dietary composition of the transition diet that can either increase or decrease the susceptibility to infectious diseases could be contributors to ultimately this sequence leading to, to lameness. And then as anything in biology, there's a lot of interconnections between these things that can um, bring about this process and, and make it much more challenging for us to, to come up with uh, a simple diagnosis and, and simple solution to improving lameness. So let's come back to this balancing act that we have to perform uh, in the rumen. On the left side of the screen, we have physically effective fiber, which is the positive, the green, the go kind of thing that produces chewing and buffer production. And on the right side of the screen, we have rumen fermentable carbohydrates that we put in the diet to promote milk production. But they have the, the stop action on the rumen itself because of the high acid production. And so rumen pH is pivoting between these two things depending on how much buffering capacity through your fiber, chewing activity, and fermentable carbohydrates. And then underscoring all of this is the environment itself, how we feed the cows, the environment that the cows are in through heat stress or through the, the surface, the cleanliness, feeding management, uh, bunk, uh, access, uh, feed availability, these all play into this. Again, showing, yeah, maybe pH is a big issue, but it's not just fiber and carbohydrates, but there's other mitigating issues upon that. And so we can see here in this graphic the, the classic disease process that we currently associate with higher lameness, problems in dairy herds is SARA, or subacute ruminal acidosis. And we define SARA based on a sort of time frame below a certain rumen pH, and depending on which author you read, it might be 5.5 or 5.6. The bottom line is if we get a rumen pH below 6, we, we do seem to impede fiber digestibility, which then, of course, impacts rumen pH. So here in these two lines, you can see the high forage diet in blue. You maintain a very nice and stable rumen pH, which is going to be very conducive to uh, good rumen health, uh, good chewing activity, buffering, and um, no issues of potential rumen uh, dysfunction. In the high grain diet, the red line, now you see you immediately get a drop in that pH, and this is due to the highly fermentable carbohydrate sources, the sugars and starches being fermented by strep bovis or similar bacteria. We see this drop below that green line of 5.6. We see a little bit of recovery. That's going to be some of the buffering actions that are taking place. 
but as that con cow continues to consume and maybe sorts her feed or does some other things, we, we see this drop uh, from further carbohydrate fermentation uh, leading to lactic acidosis, and we see this drop going all the way down to like a pH of 5, and then finally some recovery, but over a period of time. So this is another graphic sort of looking at the same thing. The green line here is representing uh, an optimum rumen pH above which we have good fiber fermentation. And then the red line is that threshold for SARA that is being defined. And, and you see the, the pH um, up and down wavering throughout the day, but you notice that the pH in this particular uh, situation is below the optimum level for fiber digestion for you know, somewhere from uh, five o'clock until almost uh, eight o'clock uh, that day. So almost 13, 14 hours there. Now, some of this may be due to feed sorting by the cows or not pushing up feed too small particle size or due to maybe over mixing, inadequate bunk space, or, or just feeding to an empty bunk type scenario. But this sh just shows how even a, a good or marginal diet balance for proper carbohydrates could be adversely affected through feeding management or in, in feeding programs. So one of our primary focuses is to look at particle size and, and consider that relative to the rate of degradation of the starch. We are now measuring starch de degradation uh, two hours, seven hour uh, in our uh, feed laboratories. This series of sieves uh, moving from the left to, to the right is the pan and then up at the very top is the number four sieve. Uh, where larger particles are. And you can see there's two series of grains that were sieved here. Uh, the bottom series that has a lot of material in that bottom pan is actually a blend of wheat and uh, barley. Both wheat and barley are highly fermentable, rapidly fermented uh, starch sources. And so this kind of distribution would be very conducive to uh, rapid drops in pH. The series of um, residues above is from a high moisture corn. And we can see there's more material up on that top screen, which is, which is good for the moisture level. This was over a 30% moisture, high moisture corn. But we do see a fair amount of that corn material showing up in the third and fourth screens. Um, being a bit smaller in particle size than what we would desire and very rapidly fermented. So this combination of grains would be very conducive to very rapid drops in pH and probably uh, major issues with subclinical uh, ruminal acidosis. And, and indeed, this, this herd did have some problems with uh, higher uh, prevalence of lameness. But it's not always just the rumen. There's, there's some new thinking that has come out looking at, and we often use manure as sort of our, our mirror or window into the functioning of the rumen. And so when we see a lot of loose manure or manure in this upper left-hand picture that uh, looks like it's got uh, bubbles in it and stuff, that being some gas trapped in there, or if you look at the uh, upper right side there, you see a lot of grain particles in there. There's, there's some concern that maybe we're getting too concerned with ruminal carbohydrates and, and trying to push to move more carbohydrates out of the rumen, sort of bypass carbohydrate concepts. And some of this may end up in the hindgut. And we usually don't think of the hindgut as a, a major digestion organ in our uh, ruminant species, but Certainly, there's the populations of bacteria that can ferment this, and we do see some potential hindgut fermentation. And this gets us into uh, the issue here where you see the two black arrows in that upper right screen pointing to something in the manure, and in that picture in the lower right shows you what they are. These are uh, mucus plugs that are 
basically the body's band-aids trying to uh, heal an irritated uh, mucosal wall or lining wall of the uh, lower digestive tract. And, and this would indicate a fair amount of inflammation that had been going on. And sure enough, this is sort of the model that we're starting to think about with lameness in uh, cattle, again, sort of taking from our horse expectations. So the fermentable carbohydrate load that comes down to the hind gut, just like in the rumen, will increase acid production, fermentation, drops the pH, we have high lactic acid, and unlike what occurs in the rumen, the mucosa or lining of the intestine, the large intestine, is much more sensitive to damage. And so we get this damaged barrier causing leakage of water, uh, proteins from the, the gut wall itself. And this is in contrast to the type of epithelium that's found, the lining that's found in the rumen, which is uh, much more like the lining of your, your skin, the, the barrier of your skin. And so we don't see this uh, damage. And, and again, this brings us back to we don't see the, the increase in endotoxin absorption because of this difference in the epithelial barrier. But what happens is this low pH can lead to bacterial death, just like in the rumen, but in the hindgut, the bacterial death then leads to endotoxin and acid. And because this is a much more sensitive uh, lining to the intestinal tract, you get translocation of the endotoxin and acid into the uh, line or the wall of the mucosa then that acid can stimulate inflammatory cells called mast cells, and these release their uh, hormone or, or compound called histamine that can then affect capillary function. And, and this is the compound that we are most concerned with uh, causing blood flow damage in the hoof walls of horses. And so maybe this model of hindgut fermentation and inflammation might have more connection to some of the issues of high grain feeding and high carbohydrate load in our ruminant species. But as I said in the beginning, it's not just the rumen and carbohydrate. Here are some studies that have been done as long as you know, 28 years ago where they recognized thinner cows at calving and you can see in this first study, had a seven-fold increase in risk for lameness. And then a, another study in the, in the early 90s indicated increased body condition score loss resulted in a higher lameness risk. A more recent study showed that, again, body condition, low body condition score at calving, those cows were 9.4 times more uh, at risk for lameness. So very similar to that study that was done in 1990. And then a more recent study that, that looked at a larger um, perspective here said the odds of lameness were 1.6 times greater in cows with low body condition score, that being defined as less than or equal to 2.5 on a 1 to 5 scale, than those cows in a higher body condition score. So this brings us to what's the connection between body condition and feet? You know, we can think maybe heavy body condition, you have more weight and that would put more pressure on your feet, but it has to do with what I'll just call the Dr. Scholl's pads in the hooves of the cow. This diagram on the left here with that arrow is indicating what's called the digital cushion. This is sort of fatty pad that protects the bone from the, the wall of the hoof. So think of it as wearing your shoe and putting a Dr. Scholl's pad in to, to kind of pad your feet within your shoe. And that's exactly what this is doing. And so what this study, this is some work uh, from Cornell, what they found is the prevalence of sole ulcers and white line disease, both diseases of uh, dysfunctional corium growth, were associated with the thickness of the digital cushion. And, and the data that they show is those cows that had the thickest digital cushion had a 
15% lower prevalence rate of hoof lesions than those that had thin. And then the key player here is body condition score was associated with the digital cushion thickness. And the bottom point where the digital cushion was the thinnest during lactation occurred at about four months of age of, of lactation. So if we look at this same data here, this is mean digital cushion thickness of the hind digits on a large number of cows. And you can see stage of lactation going from one to 10 months, we see the lowest point at about four months, which often is associated with the greatest prevalence of lameness issues within the dairy herd. This is that newer study uh, that related body condition score and lameness. And here you see body condition scores from less than or equal to two on up to greater than or equal to four and the lameness prevalence. So uh, uh, less than or equal to two, there was a 46% uh, lameness prevalence. And if you follow these graphics here, you can see a very marked decline in the prevalence rate of lameness as body condition score goes from two to three. And then it sort of plateaus off above three. So coming back to that Cornell study, this is looking at the thickness of that Scholl's, Dr. Scholl's cushion in the hoof of the cow where the lowest 25% had an adjusted prevalence of horn lesions of 24.4%. The next 25, the next lowest 25%, their prevalence rate, adjusted prevalence rate was 28. And then the next 25% highest was 14. And then you can see the highest or thickest 25% uh, of the digital cushions that they measured only had a prevalence rate of 8.6. We look at what this means relative to relative risks for thinner cushions versus thicker cushions. Even the slightly thinner cushions had almost a two-fold increase in risk, whereas the bottom 50% thinnest cushions in these cows had somewhere between almost a 3.5 to 4% greater risk of lameness. So, just this quick survey, I've tried to show that there's a number of nutritional issues as highlighted in the red box here. This is uh, kind of an overview of causes of lameness, and, and we focused only in this red box today, talking about body condition score, uh, feed intake, or, or also the diet uh, relative to acid load, but you notice in perspective to the brown encircled or brown box area, highlighted area, that's all the environmental issues that could, you know, ultimately lead to lameness. And that'll be a discussion later on by uh, another speaker in this series, Dan McFarland. And then if we go above the uh, foot lesions, claw length, foot bath fe features, this will be all part of the preventative measures and, and looking at some of the diseases. So yeah, I, nutrition is important, but it's, it's only a small piece of, of the larger picture of what brings about this very serious problem of lameness in our dairy herds. So some key points I want you to, to come away with from this uh, quick talk here this morning or this afternoon. The role of nutrition and lameness is, is really multidimensional. There are direct impacts from uh, nutrition through acidosis, whether it be rumen acidosis or hindgut acidosis. Uh, we didn't really talk about minerals, but certainly zinc and some other uh, trace minerals, as well as some other nutrients, vitamin A and, and others, can have some direct impacts in improving the quality and health of the hoof. But the other thing that we kind of focused on a bit here was the indirect effects of nutrition via body condition score loss and, and metabolic diseases. There are many interactions uh, between nutritional programs and the facilities or the environment, and, and that certainly is a big player and, and explains why 
some some farms can get away with feeding you know what I might consider high risk type diets high carbohydrate high starch type diets um, whereas others feeding very moderate risk or low risk diets may have a lot of environment or a lot of lameness that might be linked back to uh, the environment and then finally the the key point uh, the role of acidosis and laminitis uh, may not be the sole mechanism. So I've tried to point out that at least the body condition score. And again, uh, relative to the acidosis, it may not just be SARA that we all seem to focus on, but it, it may be some combination of ruminal acidosis and or hindgut acidosis. So with that, I hope you uh, have a little better perspective on what you might be able to do better uh, in your feeding program and in nutrition relative to lameness issues and, and helping to minimize this very devastating disease process and important welfare disease process uh, in our dairy herds. Thank you for your time and listening to this educational video and hope you come back in and listen to some of the other videos that Dairy XNet has and others in this series addressing this disease lameness. Thank you.